Less than a day before today's Supreme Court decision to keep the popular abortion pill, Mifepristone, on the market for now, the fight over reproductive rights played out in Indianapolis at the Southern Baptist Convention as the nation's largest Protestant denomination voted to condemn in vitro fertilization. The vote by Southern Baptists is a bellwether for where many evangelicals are on the issue. Sixty percent of delegates voted in favor of the resolution that defines embryos as people and urges delegates to lobby the government to limit IVF as it is practiced now. The catalyst for the debate at the Southern Baptist Convention was a ruling by the Alabama State Supreme Court earlier this year that frozen embryos are children. But there was disagreement about IVF even at the Baptist Convention. NBC's Aaron McLaughlin spoke to a deacon whose godson was born through IVF. Why are you disappointed by this resolution passing? I think that some of the language is a little harsher than I would like. Some of the language implies that there is no use for IVF that is ethical. And whereas I know of circumstances, because my godson was conceived in this circumstance where IVF was used in a very ethical way that is consistent with pro-life and Christian ethics. Joining me now is New York Magazine senior writer Sarah Jones and former Obama White House communications director Jen Palmieri. And welcome to you both, ladies. Um, Sarah, I want to point to our viewers that you are a former Christian fundamentalist, and you've been writing about how we got to this point where even IVF is now a hotly contested issue. So give me a very quick summary of that and how significant this non-binding vote is by the Southern Baptist Convention. Absolutely. So as you said, I did grow up a conservative evangelical. I went to a very conservative evangelical college. And of course, we heard growing up that abortion was a great sin. Um, towards the end of my time in that world, I began to hear a little more about certain forms of contraception being abortifacient, less about IVF. But there's been a study trajectory that I would argue reflects a growing radicalism within the anti-abortion movement and with conservative evangelicalism as well. OK, uh, so, um, Jen, the Biden campaign is tying this Southern Baptist vote against IVF and today's abortion pill ruling, tying it to Donald Trump and the Supreme Court that he helped shape. Separately on Capitol Hill today, Democrats are holding a messaging vote in the Senate to protect IVF. Republicans are certainly expected to vote against it. But how will all this play leading up to the election in November? I mean, the Southern, you know, the Southern Baptist Convention uh, is uh, that has a lot of that that has you know over many decades been an important political barometer. Um, you know, it used to not just be for Republicans. They used to it, that that used to be the Southern Baptist used to be a place where you saw a lot of Democrats as well. But it is an important barometer for the evangelicals and for Republicans and up. Uh, and you know, I, I saw a, a woman, a, a Trump, a former Trump policy advisor talk about this on the Christian Broadcast Network, a clip of it that the Biden campaign sent around. And basically her argument was IVF is a slippery slope. The, the same justification for IVF is the same justification for abortion. You know, it's like, are you, if, if, if you wanna eliminate IVF, are you protecting life anymore? Or are you just talking about control? You know, like mm -hmm. what is actually going on here? And I think um, the it is, you know, from when you saw every couple of weeks, Alex, there's some reminder to America of the havoc that the overturning of Roe has uh, uh, has had on the on the U.S. and on, on, on women's health and just, you know, telling women how to have children, when they can have children, whether they can have children. Um, and I, I, I it's. This is this is another reminder of that. I don't understand why the Senate Republicans would not vote to protect um, IVF. I don't understand why they all voted to also not protect contraception um, as a right. We had the opportunity to do that a couple of weeks ago. Um, you know, the Mifeprestone uh, decision that happened in the Supreme Court today is good news, but it's just a stay. That case will continue in 16 states that have banned it already. Hmm. So you just see it is, you know, that the women's right, reproductive rights, um, it's under assault everywhere. And it all goes back to Trump. He is the one that created the situation. And the Biden team is right to continue to say he owns this. Yeah. And these are the people, people like the Southern Baptist Convention, he will do their bidding. That That is what the plan is. Project 2025, all of this, that is what, um, you know, that's what they're attempting to, uh, will attempt to legislate next mm -hmm. year. Mm -hmm, indeed. Um, Sarah, the New York Times uh, reports that 171,000 patients traveled for abortion care last year. They went from states that have bans in place. 
I mean, what an economic cost to women, many of whom may not have the means to afford it, in addition to the health and the mental strain they're facing, right? It's an extreme burden, especially on low-income women. We've known this for a long time. It just hasn't mattered to the anti-abortion movement whatsoever, which claims that it is for women, that, that it can balance the rights of the fetus with the rights of the woman. And we've seen in practice that that's just not true. We can see it in the burden that's been placed on these women who are traveling such extreme distances just to access a basic legal right. Yeah, right you are. Jen, um, here's something to think about, because uh, there is supposed to be a separation of church and state in our system of government, a tenant in the First Amendment known as the Establishment Clause, which states, Congress shall make no law respecting the establishment of religion. But the issue of abortion makes you question if that's now the case. Yeah, the, I mean, the other thing uh, from this week, uh, Alex, is the recording that we heard from uh, Justice Alito, where a person who he does not know at a public event put a microphone in front of him and asked him a question that he answered. Uh, and my, I, the point I'm making here is that he was very uh, comfortable sharing this view, which is a bit shocking, that where he said that he thought it was a that the United States should be a nation of godliness. You know, that that is that is that is that is not where Supreme Court justices have, you know, have been. That is not, um, and to uh, actually say that out loud in a in a public setting, I think it, it was, I found it really jarring to see um, if you're willing to say that um, in that kind of setting, what's happening behind closed doors um, with the, you know, with the conservative members of the Supreme Court and the kind of agenda that they are, pursuing when you're willing to be that public about it. Yeah, it's a big question. You have to wonder uh, which we're doing right now. Thank you very much to both of you, Sarah Jones and Jen Palmieri.